Are we, Sorry, are we good yeah. to go? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Doug. Okay. Five o'clock. All this uh, meeting of the Kansas County Public Health District Number One Board of Commissioners to order. Um, it's five o'clock. It is March twenty eighth, two thousand twenty four. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have the agenda. There is one change to the agenda. The capital expenditure request for Radio Hill parking expansion under E5 there. 6E5. Um, we're going to move that to a discussion during executive session under property. We won't, of course, make any, any decisions or any votes uh, during the executive session. Um, but uh, that will be moved then. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of approving the agenda, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Well, well, oh, sorry. We have to make a motion. All right. To Move to approve the agenda. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. Sorry aye. about that uh, breach of protocol. All right. Sure. Thank you for catching. Okay, the consent agenda, we're going to pull, I've had a request to pull the minutes from the last meeting, uh, which we will um, discuss and uh, reintroduce, I think, at our next uh, next regular meeting in uh, April. But uh, so we'll pull that, uh, the minutes from the last meeting, uh, the last board meeting, discuss that. What's remaining then are the approval checks, the foundation report, and the minutes from the finance committee. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda with that change? So moved. Okay, motion from Becca, Erica, second from Bob. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda with that amendment, please say aye. 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 Thank you all. Okay, now it's time for public comments and announcements. Um, if you have a public comment, please begin by stating your name and uh, where you're from. Uh, try to keep your comment or announcement to uh, three minutes. And please remember that uh, we don't, the board does not respond during the meeting to public comments, uh, but we take a turn and we'll try to respond um, after at some point. Uh, meeting. Is there anybody here who would like to make a public comment or announcement? Okay, seeing nobody, uh, we'll move on then. We have two presentations. Our first presentation is to recognize uh, Safe Catch Awards for the fourth quarter, 2023. And uh, as I've said numerous times in, in uh, past meetings, this is uh, really one of my favorite parts of, the, of this job. Uh, we always get a lot of really good nominations to QI Council and have, uh, it's always a really hard decision because there's so many really good people who are recognized in these nominations. Um, we have uh, two people actually here to, uh, to be recognized for the great work they do. So let me remind everybody what a safe catch is. Safe catch involves at least one of the following. The catch prevented an event from reaching a patient or staff member. The catch prevented pain, delays in care, unnecessary costs, or workflow inefficiencies. The situation was high risk or had potential for greater patient harm, such as communication errors, surgical site infections, or falls. The catch led to frontline or just-in-time improvement. Okay. Our first Safe Catch Award for the fourth quarter of 2023 is uh, our clinical award winner is Christine Ward. Christine, hi, thank you for coming. Uh, and the uh, she was nominated by Sarah Dvorak. Um, and the reason for nomination was speaking up to ensure timely and accurate patient care. So here's the, uh, what uh, Sarah wrote for the nomination. Christine saw a patient and ordered an x-ray to rule out pneumonia. When results returned, she felt that the impression from the radiologist did not match her assessment in clinic and her assessment of the chest x-ray. She went and spoke with the radiologist in person. And after a second look, he determined the patient did in fact have pneumonia and would benefit from more care. This was a representation of patient advocacy and safe practice. And I know it's not always easy to speak up in situations like this, but uh, we really appreciate you, you doing so. So thank you very much, Chris. And uh, she's an ARMP in pediatrics. 
Okay, our next uh, award to recognize tonight, we had two winners for the non-clinical award, Jody Morris and Tara Quick. So I'll quit that Tara couldn't make it, but we do have Jody here. Um, and uh, the reason for nomination here is recognizing inconsistencies of weight and waste with BP cuffs. Uh, nominator was Trent Baker, an engineering supervisor. And these, uh, and both uh, Jody and Tara are in engineering. So here's here's the reason for the nomination. Jody Morris and Tara Quicksall recognize some departments have disposable BP cuffs and others have reusable. This led to confusion regarding infection prevention concerns, such as reusing the disposable cuffs and cleaning procedures for the different types of cuffs. It also led to increased waste waste as reusable cuffs were being disposed of. The suggestion has been brought forward to the value analysis committee to determine a consistent process moving forward. Thank you very much, Jody. We'll uh, unmute Jody and on behalf of the board, we really appreciate uh, both uh, uh, the work that both of you have done and uh, we're glad <coughs> and we're happy to recognize you for the uh, for this wonderful work. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna go out to, in the hall and Terry, who's also on the QI Council, if you don't mind getting a quick picture with us, we appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot, John, if you yeah. wouldn't mind yeah. taking over the meeting. All right, so they will be back momentarily, but uh, it's pushing forward. We're going to do 5B, which is uh, Jake Milstein from Critical Insight. Uh, we met uh, Jake and uh, some of his team at the conference in Orlando dealing with cybersecurity, which, as we know, has become even more relevant to a lot of hospitals in this country. Uh, and over the last few weeks, it sounds like they've been able to work with uh, with our team here just to discuss some things. And they're just going to present kind of their state-of-the-art perspective of, of where we stand and things that we should be thinking about. And uh, it's here to kind of make sure the other board members have some exposure to this also, since they were not at this particular conference. So, Jake, go ahead and take it away, and, and they'll be back in momentarily, and hopefully they won't... Uh, be too far behind when they return from their photo op. Sorry, I couldn't read the top of the screen there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so let me um, let me actually start with just introductions of um, who I am and who I'm with. So my name is Jake Milstein, um, and I work for Critical Insight. We're a cybersecurity company based in Seattle, um, and we are the American Hospital Association preferred provider for for a lot of the services that we provide hospitals. We have, uh, uh, I talk to hospitals around the country. I talk to the AHA Rural Conference. Um, and, you know, I see all sorts of things and all sorts of hospitals. And I want to be clear, we don't work with giant hospitals. We work with regional and rural hospitals that have relatively small IT teams because those are the folks who generally need our help. You know, the Virginia Masons of the world have giant teams and providences have giant teams and that's not who we work with. So something like Kinsey says, well, you who work with. And I'm here with Garrett Silver, who's our CEO and Garrett, you know, uh, Yeah, Garrett Silver, CEO uh, of Critical Insight and also a graduate of Clayolum Rosalind High School. So uh, some of you may know my stepfather, Doug Johnson was the local math teacher. Uh, like Jake said, we work with hospitals across the nation, but it's always a joy to come back to Kittitas County and have a conversation. So good to be with you all. And then um, you guys want to do quick introductions? Yeah, then we'll get you. you all know me. Um, I, I invited uh, Evan Schnitzias as well. So Evan is our security analyst. So every time you click on that little fish button, Evan gets that email <laughs> to verify. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you know, really behind the scenes, um, but wanted to highlight uh, all of the work he's done over the last two years of uh, being in the step of uh, position. So, and I and and to that end, I talk to a lot of hospital boards. I talk to a lot of hospital CEOs, CFOs, and for a hospital this size to have a dedicated security individual is unusual, and is great. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the slides that I went over um, when I met Terry and John at AHA Rural. Um, and, uh, and then what we're going to do is talk about your security posture, um, and they're going to go over where you're doing well and some, uh, some gaps that, uh, that they need some assistance with. So what's going on cyber, cyber landscape-wise? Number one, nation states. So 
it really is true that North Korea's weapons program is funded by ransomware on hospitals and other organizations in the U.S. That is not a made up thing. Um, and um, Russia really is attacking the United States through ransomware, as is Iran. Russia does it through gangs. The Iranian government just does it. And when the Chinese do it, um, when the Chinese government does it, they're not attacking using ransomware. They're just stealing data. So that's sort of the landscape that's out there. Now, why is that really important? It's really important because these two guys are great and they are up against 100,000 people internationally working for nation states attacking. It's, it's not a fair fight. And you got you to gotta know that. Second, new attack tactics. So the bad guys are always getting better at what they do. They're always getting better at how to inflict damage and how to lock up a network. Their goal is generally money, right? Their goal is, okay, we're going to get in the network. We're going to lock up the network. And then we're going to say, hey, you need to pay us. Now, why is healthcare the most attacked? Well, it's because you have the most to lose and the most likely to pay the ransom with patient lives on the line. And all of you in this room are here because you care about patients. If somebody came to you and said, oh my gosh, we're going to have bad outcomes if we don't pay this ransom, you're going to say, well, should we discuss paying the ransom? Where at a bank or a credit union, they're just going to say, no, shut the network down. It's money, not people. And so that is one of the reasons why there is so much, so many attacks on hospitals. Also, it's very hard for you to just shut down the network. If you just shut down the network, it could impact patients. The bad guys know that. So what they've started doing now, because there are better defenses, is they're contacting patients. So, and this happened at Fred Hutch in Seattle. The bad guys got in, um, and when Fred Hutch didn't pay the ransom, they started emailing patients. And they say, hey, we have your data. You better call Fred Hutch and tell him to pay the ransom. Or another hospital had, a, had an incident uh, in Oklahoma where they started saying to patients, hey, um, pay us $3, and for $3, we can show you whether we have your data, and for 50 bucks, you can make sure your data doesn't end up on the dark web. And so this is a new attack tactic. We're going to see more of that this year, and what it means is if hospitals have ransomware attacks, they can no longer be quiet and just say, we're having an IT incident, because you can be almost certain that the bad guys are going to start calling your patients. So that has to be now part of your incident response plan. Lastly, third or two other things, third party attacks. I created this slide before the change healthcare attack, um, but we're gonna see an increase in third party attacks because if you're a bad guy, you know, I can attack one hospital and I can get this, but if I attack a third party, now all of a sudden I can get into to multiple hospitals and affect multiple hospitals and class action lawsuits. So after every attack, we're now seeing a minimum of three class action lawsuits against that hospital. I was just talking to a lawyer. Um, he is finishing up a case of a class action lawsuit for a hospital that got attacked in 2019. It's 2024, and he's just finishing that case up, and the hospital has spent almost $2 million defending it. So these are things that are happening. This is the landscape that we're in. So two recent attacks talk about Number one, Madison Health, they spoke at AHA Rural. Um, they're in Idaho. They have a prescription provider, not related to change healthcare. Um, bad guys got into the prescription provider. They were hooked into the network. Bad guys got from the prescription provider into the hospital network. Um, the prescription provider knew for five days that they had something going on in their network. They told They did not tell their customers anything. They didn't disclose it. To this day, they haven't answered the hospital's calls about you let bad guys get into our network. The hospital had a third party managed service provider that saw the attack and helped the hospital stop it, but they still got some patient data, but it didn't shut down the hospital. Again, third party attack. Second, change healthcare. I think everybody is familiar with the attack. Um, and we could spend an hour talking about it, but we don't have that amount of time. So what I will say, importantly for this, is the change healthcare attack is different 
than other hospital attacks or other healthcare attacks because of how many patients it affected. How many people, individuals, were not able to get, and still some of them not able to get prescriptions when they go to CVS, when they go wherever. And so I believe that this is actually going to force regulation that maybe we would have seen delayed a couple of years. So what does that look like? So this right here is what's called the NIST cybersecurity framework. The federal government has said that every critical infrastructure organization needs to start aligning to the NIST framework. When I say critical infrastructure, that includes healthcare, it's healthcare, it's utilities, it's cities, it's counties, critical infrastructure. And what that means is everyone needs to have a cybersecurity program that aligns to all of these items. And then for healthcare, there are mitigating practices here but really importantly, the HHS cybersecurity performance goals. So it's confusing that there are these three things, but really what does this mean? This is the overarching framework. And then these cybersecurity performance goals that I'm about to show you are what we believe the federal government right now is calling the voluntary CPGs that will likely become mandatory, but regardless are really good practices. And these are the CPGs. They put them into two categories, essential and enhanced. We think that it's ridiculous that there are two categories because the criminals are enhanced. You can't just do the essential things. And by the way, if you have cybersecurity insurance or anything, you've had to do most of the things that are on the essentials for a very long time. But these are the 20 cybersecurity performance goals. So what we did here, um, as you look at this, I'm just gonna pick out a couple that are really important, multi-factor authentication. And this is something I talk to boards about all the time, You know, especially board members need to make sure they have MFA turned on all of their devices in everything they do. The bad guys will come after your Gmail accounts, will come after your Yahoo accounts, whatever you have, make sure you have MFA turned on everywhere. And of course, for the entire organization. Um, and then on the enhanced, you want to make sure that you're testing your environment. Oh, look, third party. Well, that's not a surprise, right? We just talked about that. Third party attacks have become the number one way the bad guy get in gets in to any hospital organization. It used to be phishing attacks. It used to be getting in through users, making mistakes. It's not anymore. It's third party attacks. And everybody has a responsibility here. It's not just IT. A lot of organizations make the mistake of saying, well, we've given it to this great IT director we've hired, and so we're washing our hands of it, and we're just going to trust this IT director to do it. That's not good enough anymore. Everybody has to have responsibilities, including boards, because one of the things we've seen in, um, in larger companies and publicly traded companies is when there's a cyber attack, some of the board members are starting to get called in trials that come up. And we can name a few, like the Uber um, attack and a few others where board members are now getting called in trials. Um, and some of them uh, mostly civil, some criminal. But everybody has a cybersecurity responsibility. I don't have time to go through the next slide, but I put it in here so that everyone has it. This is John Regi at the American Hospital Association slide about all of the questions the board should be able to answer about an attack. What will work? What won't work? What's the plan? These are questions every board should go through with their IT director, with the CEO, in case of attack that you're prepared. So one of the things that we did with Jeff was um, to say, okay, since the CPGs, the cybersecurity performance goals, are going to become mandatory. And at this point are voluntary, but really you should do them. When we were AHA Rural, John Rigi, who runs cybersecurity for the AHA, and I sat up there and told everybody, all right, every board, every hospital needs to sit down and understand where you stand with the cybersecurity performance goals. And so what they put together for you all was, remember I showed you that list down here? Here, each one of the essential goals 
And here's each one of the enhanced goals off the top. And what they've put together for you is how they're tackling each one and where there are gaps. And so I'm gonna invite them up to do this. And I have to say, um, the, for the size hospital you have, or the team that you have, they are remarkably ahead of other hospitals. They've done a really nice job of this. I don't, I, I cannot think of another hospital I've talked to that's been able to put together a tree that looks quite like this. Do you want to come up sure. here? Yeah. So really what we put together, you know, as uh, Jake mentioned, is is aligning with uh, with the essential and the, and, um, the advanced CPGs. What you see in blue, the dark blue, is things we already have in place. Um, what you see in the greens is things that we recently implemented. Um, the yellows are what are things in progress at this point. So we're progressing through this um, year after year. This will, you know, still be a work in progress. We'll have more. Um, you can move over to the enhance. Um, and then on the reds are, are things that what is coming in the future that we're going to be working on. Uh, so whether it's the third party, a real formal third party risk management uh, solution uh, to be able to track those. And then um, some applications around what we call SIM. Um, security incident event manager. So where we can put all of the security instances together, just like what we do for maybe like Verge, where everything falls into one place. And through that, we can monitor and see some of the connections between what's happening um, from a separate security standpoint. So if Evan, you want to add somebody to this? He, this, this was done by Evan. So this is great work that Evan's been doing behind the scenes as well. So. Um, not much to add, but I think one thing, if you want to go back one, I think the biggest thing that I find interesting that we're working on now is our IR plan. And so we just really just started this. Basically, we're going to have all these run books of if, then, what, what we need to do as an organization. And we're going to run through some scenarios. So when something does happen, we do have an exposure. We have all the plans for it. And I think, you know, that's going to just elevate us completely. So yep. that's it. We, we can add one, too, right now. Evan, yeah. <laughs> um, does that include a community? I apologize. I can't read it all. Does that include a communication plan with regard to cyber attack? That would be yeah, all absolutely. incorporated into the plan. Yeah. yeah, where it goes and then who needs to be notified, when they need to be notified, and when it needs to go outside of our little circle, all that. What, what is IR? It's in a response. It's a, thank you. Yeah. Okay. You can go to the next slide. If you thought healthcare had a lot of acronyms, just wait for cyber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, we're, and really well, all we wanted to show were the three vendors that we currently work with. These are all what we call best of breed vendors. Um, so whether it's no before, which you guys all know about email phishing, right? And reporting, Fortified does our security risk assessment. Um, annual pen testing, monthly vulnerability testing, and then CrowdStrike does basically our 24 seven monitoring. So all of the PCs in the hospital are looked at um, constantly 24 seven. And so if someone logs into a computer that is not typically logged into, like if Jason goes down and do surgery and logs into the computer, we know that this is unusual, right? So it tracks everything down to that, that standpoint. So, um, you know, obviously more work on this uh, as we move forward and um, we'll have more to do. But um, as, you know, Jake will mentioned, um, it's an ever changing world. And so we think of this as a, a great progress that we've done so far, but we still have lots to do. So, yeah, yeah. if Jason goes down to surgery and does that, Crowds, CrowdStrike senses it, what happens then? If it sees, uh, you, go ahead. Basically, if that happens, we get alerted, it sends us an alert, and then it gives me a log for the last hour of what your activity was. And then I go there and say, does this look like something we really need to look at? Is it weird? Is it not weird? And then we kind of make a decision from that. And if we think it's something that is suspicious enough, we'll contact you, we'll change passwords. All so so they don't have the authority to shut something down. It, does, it comes back to you to make that judgment because you have the insider knowledge of what it might actually yeah, Absolutely, be. yep. Yeah. And what's the turnaround time on that worst case scenario, you think? It depends on severity. So they all have a score out of 10. So if it's anything above a seven, we get notified on our on call. And so anytime and within 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I think is the average. If it's a lower medium, it'll send us a notification and we'll check on it in the morning. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, a good, so a good way to think about cybersecurity is in three buckets. 
preparing and protecting against an attack, which means all of the incident response planning, which means, you know, stopping attacks that come through email, which means stopping things at the firewall. But then you also have detection, because remember how I talked about the nation states? Like, the bad guys will get in. This is not, not a, this is a foregone conclusion. They want to get in. They will. And so the detection says, okay, something bad has happened. What, to your question, what are we going to do about it now? And then what's our response plan and how do we respond to it? The organizations that have developed the worst cybersecurity postures are ones who only focus on the first bucket. We're going to stop all the attacks. Can't happen. And we see that over and over. We talk to hospitals that say, oh, yeah, we'll just stop them all. I mean, change healthcare is pretty large. The FBI is pretty large. The bad guys have gotten into both. So you can't stop them all. So what they're talking about here is how do you, and your question, how do you detect them? Yeah. Yeah. And and we always see it's a balance across the entire environment, right? So training um, is one piece, but then if somebody gets in, then what do we do? Uh, and then if somebody does get in, how do we recover as well? So it, it's the whole picture that we focus on. Yeah. yeah. And right. one thing I also want to point out here is he said it's a journey. It, right. it is a journey, right? So the fact that there's red on the chart is not surprising. Um, and frankly, there should be red on everyone's chart. Like nobody has done all of this. And once you do it, once you once you start turning over rocks, you you find more things under the rock. Um, and the bad guys only need one thing to get in, and you can do a million things right and get one thing wrong. So, you know, that's why it's important to continue to do this, which, you know, takes me to, you know, the takeaways from AHA. And but I really do want to say, like, you guys have done a really nice job. And they need your help finishing the 20 CPGs. Um, so the takeaways from AHA were, all right, build, build a new incident response plan addressing today's questions. And the questions we brought up in the presentation were, you know, what, what happens when a bad guy gets in? Your question about com what's our communications plan? So your communications plan now needs to change this year based on the fact that the bad guys are contacting patients. Um, Test it with a tabletop exercise because a plan written down is not useful, especially if it's on a network that's locked up. Um, and so things need to be tested. Um, and then rebuild everybody's board executive reporting on cybersecurity using the CPGs. And one of their asks is to have a compliance platform so that it can be automated reporting. But this tree that you just saw is what large hospital, large hospital system boards are demanding of their IT department and are rare in hospitals this size. And so the board's ability to see that and see how that progresses and see those greens turn to blues and see the reds turn to greens. And I think blue is the final color there is what is what board should be asking for. Um, and that's the present. That's my that's my more than fifteen minutes. Can you um, do a, a brief description of what a tabletop exercise would look like? Yeah. Um, so um, uh, so if you have an incident response plan, you know what you want to do is say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna test a couple of different incidents. So I will tell you all about one that we did. Uh, with an organization just before the change healthcare attack, uh, California Hospital. Um, one of we looked at their risks and where they have the most risk, and they had a lot of risk in a bunch of third party platforms. And so we developed a scenario where they got all of their stakeholders around a table that looks a lot like this um, chief nursing officer, uh, you know, general counsel, communications person, CEO, all sorts of folks. And we said, okay, now we're going to test this. All right, it's, um, you know, it's midnight. And all of a sudden, you know, information stops flowing from this third party vendor. What do you do now? So he says, well, we call the IT director. IT director didn't pick up the phone. It's midnight. Now what are you going to do? And so you walk through an entire tabletop scenario like that. 
And so what we did is, is one of the things that, and then F, you do the whole thing and you walk through an entire scenario and we have people who are, who are expert at this. Um, at the end of it, everybody says, okay, what'd you learn? And everybody talks about their findings. Like, oh, well, I didn't know that I needed legal permission before I put out a statement. Or I didn't realize, you know, if this went down, we don't have a backup for it or the various learnings. So once they have those various learnings, um, then we create an after action report of, you know, here are the things you should learn. This hospital in California, their big, one of their biggest learnings was, wow, we have too much concentrated risk in a few vendors. Like if this vendor goes down, we're in big trouble. And so... They have, they're large enough to have a, a CISO, a, a Chief Information Security Officer. Their CISO you know, thought through that and developed backup plans for all of their major vendors. Obviously, one of the largest vendors they have is Epic, um, I think, it, you know, which is an EHR vendor. Um, but because they started doing that, when the change healthcare attack happened, they had a backup. They had a backup in mind. And they were like, wow, this is just like our tabletop exercise. And people knew what to do, even though they, we hadn't practiced change. We had practiced, okay, they practiced a, a crisis. And so practicing that crisis, there's also, um, you know, another one of, oh, uh, you know, it's, it's 4 p.m. on a Friday and the printers have stopped working. But, you know, we don't see anything in the network. Now what? And, you know, it turns into a ransomware attack. So, you know, there are all sorts of different tabletop exercises people do. Um, sometimes they mix it with a business continuity uh, attack that, uh, you know, there's an earthquake. Um, but, you know, the ones that we focus on are generally computer related issues because we're cybersecurity. In a healthcare environment, would you ever, as an exercise, actually turn off part of the network to see what happens? Or is that too, too much risk with medical issues happening real time? I think that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in my perspective, you wouldn't, but you would practice as if you, so you, you did. Practice the scenario like it's happening. So, okay. I mean, yeah, as a former CIO, a tabletop exercise is meant to get the human element, yeah. your brain is turning, and to start to really get that visceral experience of what's yeah. it like to walk through a real incident yeah. and understand where your gaps are and also get the practice so that when the house is on fire, you know how to use the house, the fire extinguisher, right? Um, from an IT perspective, it would be common to do an actual like disaster recovery failover in a very controlled setting to make sure that like you can actually go to your warm standby, for instance, um, but not not surprise yourself with something that real. <laughs> from a from a from a cult from a interestingly from a culture perspective, organizations that do things like that make their employees hate their IT department. Good that. Oh. And you, so, I mean, you don't, you, so organizations that do phishing testing that, that have like a wall of shame that then, you know, do <laughs> like really terrible things to the employees who click to, I, you know, there's, there's a point at which it's brutal enough that you can create an adversarial relationship where what you really want is an employee who sees the printer not working immediately calls IT and says, hey, this printer's not working and it usually works. Or, you know, if somebody has a, if their, if their workstation is slower than usual, you want them to have a good relationship with IT. So they call IT. You don't want them to have that feeling of, well, if I call IT, IT is going to blame me because they might have just caught a cyber attack. So I, culture, I would avoid doing things that make people angry. That's, that's an excellent point. Uh, just, just, <laughs> next time you're in a conference, just know I misunderstood then at the conference. I thought you indicated you did take small sets. Not you, it might've been John that was talking about, but yeah. somehow in the discussion, I thought they talked about, let's actually shut down some computers and see how that staff, how quickly they can convert to non-computer work to keep patients going. But I, John, John, I think now it was on okay. a table, not as- So, so, so yes, John, John Regi did say that. Okay. His background is at the FBI, and he, uh, you know, he also he likes that thrill. He, he, he all, I mean, you know, look, his job before healthcare cybersecurity was he took down the mafia in New Jersey. 
he has a he comes at things with a blunt <laughs> attitude. Culture, I think. Is is an achievement signal. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why we bring people in. We talk the next time we have a planned downtime, I want you to come hang out with us. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> which we do. Well, well, which we do. We, we have we do a lot of downtimes, okay. and, okay. and we do have things yeah. happening. And all of those things are taken into yeah. account on the tabletop exercise. Yes. Yeah. We, we, we have seen longer term successes from organizations that have a culture of security where everybody trusts the IT and security people. Because the truth about security is we're all insecure, right? Every time you use MF, everybody know what MFA is, the multi-factor authentication where you're using an app or yeah. Um, we're all insecure. And so we all have to have that attitude. The cultures of the organizations that have a culture of security are, are, are the ones that succeed better. One of the things that we're gonna see as, well, we'll see how transparent change healthcare is. Um, but you know, some of the stuff we've seen from people who work there when there was a merger was they sort of lost their culture of security. Um, and you know, that might not have led to the attack, but it might have helped. In, in uh, addition to MFA or in, a, in, uh, in exchange for, are pass keys beginning to, would they be used in healthcare? Um, I mean, yes. Yeah, yeah. It I depends. mean, yeah. There are places for some of those types of applications, yeah. but not what you know widespread. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that is true is that healthcare software is slower to adopt things than things outside of healthcare. Sometimes for a bad, sometimes for bad reason, and sometimes for good reason. You know, one of the good reasons is you want to test, 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 so it doesn't impact patient safety. Where, like, you know, in a non-healthcare environment, if something goes wrong and takes the network down for an hour, ah, who cares? Not true of healthcare. So sometimes the slowness in healthcare is good, and sometimes it's really terrible. Ooh. Can you touch base on the whole Optum change, United Healthcare? I mean, you know, there's just there's nothing on the news talking about this, right? How, where they kind of fell, where the vulnerabilities were, I mean, what's backstory on how that happened to what, you know. We will also be getting a, an update from Jeff and Jason okay. a little bit later, but okay. uh, but if you want to give us yeah. a little bit. Well, so, so in terms of how it happened, they, they have not disclosed that. Um, there is a lot of talk that it came through what's called a, um, a zero day vulnerability. And so what a zero day vulnerability is, is a software vulnerability that the bad guys find out about before somebody knows to patch it or fix it. And so they can get into a system without anybody knowing. It's, what a, it's essentially what a zero day is. Um, it may also be that, uh, Change or Optum didn't move fast enough to patch it. And all of that is conjecture at this point because Chain Opt, Change Optum have not been forthright about how the bad guys got it. Um, the reason, I mean, why haven't you seen more news about it um, is frustrating to me. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, it was like this thing that happened and then the effects started to trickle down and right now we're starting to see major, major impacts. Um, uh, uh, two physicians clinics uh, closed this week um, because they couldn't make payroll and you know, they just decided to declare bankruptcy and close their doors. I think we're gonna see more of that. I know that there are a bunch of organizations where the official cybersecurity provider for the Idaho Hospital Association. And I know, um, there's a bunch of organizations that have gotten loans from St. Luke's just to keep their doors open. Um, and so I think as we see more of that, we're going to see it. Um, but I think the change healthcare attack didn't actually shut down any hospitals. And so because it's a healthcare attack, but hospitals didn't get shut down and patients diverted, it didn't make the same kind of news, even though it had such wide impacts. That's my take on it. Yeah. No, I think I think you're correct, and and they were focused really on the, you know, in the response on the front end with patient care, 
but as we all know, the financial side is now, you know, the side that's truly affected and is kicking in. How much of that will be in the news? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one other really interesting part of the change attack, and this is conjecture, but is out there, is so somebody after the change attack put 21, 25 million dollars, somewhere, some, tw I forget, 21, 25 million dollars, 22. 22 million dollars, see, it was somewhere between 21 and 25, uh, 22 million dollars in a crypto wallet for the bad guys. Change didn't admit that it paid the ransom, but it fits. But then, um, so the way ransomware generally works is there's a gang that creates the ransomware and then they license it out. And so other criminals then use the ransomware, attack a hospital, and then they split the proceeds. Well, the proceeds went to this group but they didn't pay the other group and they fled with all the money. And so the big group and claimed they were taken down and claimed they were, and, but yeah. a, a, they didn't give the decryption key to change. So if change paid the $22 million ransom because of these two gangs fighting, they didn't get the decryption key. Oh, and by the way, on the website for the bad guys, they put up a site that said we've been taken down by the FBI with an FBI logo. So don't come looking for us. Completely made up. They took a screenshot of the FBI website and just put it on theirs. The FBI is like, we didn't, like, we would have loved to do this, but we didn't do this. And so, like, that's the thing. Like, these are all really shady, awful games. And you can't trust them. And they're criminals. <laughs> so... Huh? Who, who, who would have thought, right? Yeah. Right, right. They're bad. The biggest healthcare organization on the planet, United Healthcare. I mean, they're huge. So yeah, they're vulnerable. Everybody. That's exactly yeah. right, which is why, you know, which is why looking at the plan is really important, right? All right we're going to do everything we can, and then we're going to have a really strong response when the bad guy get in. You have to assume that if the bad guys can get into that organization, they can get into yours. So what's our plan? Okay, uh, we have any uh, last questions? It's hard for going more than 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, sorry. I thought this was fantastic. It was um, informative, entertaining, conversational. I appreciate it. Anything else? Yeah, I really appreciate you both coming in tonight to spend time and, and the weeks leading up to this dealing and working with our IT group to uh, you know, put this presentation together. Yeah, and, and again, they've, they've done a really nice job of putting together a program. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. We were, we're impressed with your team. Um, and every journey has read on it. You know, there's gaps. Yeah. And the fact that you know your gaps and you're working to address them is a, ahead of the game compared to other hospitals we visit. So yeah. excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, but it looks like they're aware. Yeah. Okay, so we have our reports and dashboards. Uh, as we proceed, I just want to let you know we have a very full agenda tonight, so uh, please be mindful of that as we go. Uh, we've all had a chance to review the, uh, the agendas beforehand and the uh, packets. So, first up, we have uh, Mandy Olson with Quality. Mandy. Yep, my report starts on page 12. and. To answer any questions. Are there any questions about uh, Mandy's quality improvement reports? Yeah. Uh, I would just ask uh, your your note on the employee health um, increase in needle stick. Um, what do you think is causing that increase? Have you traced that? Because you're doing the every single one you have to do root cause analysis on, and so there um, have been a number of issues. Just variety, yeah, so not one so system training. Um, some of it is devices, some is patient factors. Um, um, so there's, there's been, uh, the, the good thing is there is, is we can do on a number of them. So they are looking at some different products in some cases. And uh, so it's, I think uh, it's one of those things where we must do a root cause analysis. And I think it's worthy of it. There's really good information we get from the um, employee or staff person. And, uh, Thank you. And supervisors, yeah. There's, Testing prophylaxis if necessary, as required by law. 
Yes, that's uh, part of OSHA requirements for bloodborne pathogen exposures. The mental and emotional component of that is there. Are we can employees access is that going to be a key? As well as part of what's required is that they are uh, um, they're offered a visit with the physician, and so they can talk about the risks and and uh, what's what happens next. So we can't tell them where yes. they have that visit. They they can choose, but we have to provide it if they want it. So There's access to. Uh, absolutely. Dr. Frick at uh, Workplace Health or in our emergency department, but we can't force them to have that uh, visit and they can see who they choose to see. Any other questions about the reports or the dashboard? You saw that uh, the dashboard looks a little different this month. Starts with am ambulatory services, hospital quality, community care quality, patient safety reporting. At this point, there are no new measures. There is, there's only one measure besides the way it looks that's changed, um, and that's the reports of incidents with harm. Um, and that's why we included the date, the glossary this time, um, so that that's there. So that won't be in future board packets. It's available to you at any time. But um, we we just changed the categorization. So it used to be that it was category D or higher, and we changed it to category E or higher. So. Um, that was kind of confusing at times where it's like most of these aren't actually causing harm to the patient. They're, we're watching to make sure there's no harm, but it's not harm. So we changed it to category E where it's, um, we were, intervention was required uh, with the patient. Any other questions from Mandy about either the report or the dashboard? That's fine. Next up. CEO report, Julie Peterson. Yeah, just a couple of updates on things I mentioned on the safety net assessment program. There's been no update from Washington State Hospital Association about whether or not um, the Department of Health is going to change that deadline with the federal government. So I expected there was a rural call scheduled for this morning and expected to hear that that was canceled. Um, as Matt indicated, Jeff hopefully is going to be back. State. Um, All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, to talk to us about change, both from an IT perspective and Jason from a. Um, and I, I would just look a second ago. There's we've received no additional communication from the Attorney General's office with regard to the Reproductive Privacy Act. You see the new policy, which I think is just really nice and clean, directly linked from our internet. Page. Um, it is posted. We've done that. We have one more meeting, follow up meeting on this, but the education has been rolled out. The scripting has been provided, correct, Stacey? Correct. And people have been trained. It's been built in for competencies. Dr. Martin has managed the medical information component of it with regard to providers and, and who's available to provide blood services. So, so who approves the policy? Um, the Policy was an administrative policy. So there's no uh, many review data for that's just no. Yeah. Um, we think there's some more work to, we wanted to get this done. We think there's some other committees that probably needs to be socialized with, but we needed to get a clean copy of the policy done pretty quickly. So um, I did just learn, so I was looking at my phone. I had heard that other hospitals were hearing from the AG, and it sounds like both Chelan and Whitman. Hospitals are in back and forth with the attorney general on this, but so far we have not heard. Um, we spent a lot of time and energy today and yesterday. Thank you, Mandy. We preparing for Congressman uh, Schreier's visit tomorrow. We're expecting her at about 1 30. And you read the good news about Hospital District 2, and um, probably someone associated with Hospital District 2 will be asking to prevent to this board in an educational format about why that levy lid lift of their EMS levy back to 25 is critical to the hospital district too. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions about the CEO report? Then we have uh, an update from Jeff Shimon and Jason Hedler about the change job. Let me start. Yeah, go for it. Okay. 
Um, so we've been, this is five weeks in to the cyber event with change. Um, as Bob mentioned, change is one of the largest uh, healthcare systems out there. They run a hundred different critical applications or services uh, within the healthcare uh, ecosystem. Um, we're on a call. We've been on a call every day for the all five weeks. And so um, with Oracle Health, um, trying to transition our clearinghouse to another vendor, uh, which we have successfully, we've successfully done. Um, the logistics and the complexity behind it is tremendous. Um, during this time, uh, Jason's team, finance team and route cycle um, have been doing uh, laborious manual posting and some other things in the background um, as we're trying to transition this uh, over to another clearing house. Um, we're starting to see some progress within the last, we've seen some progress all along, but we've really seen some, some significant progress over the last five, four to five days with uh, some um, confirmation that we have some dollars going into the bank now. Right? So as of today, um, so I don't know if you want to. Can, yes. I, can I just, so uh, Jeff, you mentioned today, change itself is showing $14 billion in claims. Back yes. Then. Yeah, so as of today, there were 14 billion um, stacked up behind the change uh, clearinghouse that is just waiting to go. So, yeah. So as of last Friday, so a lot, a lot of progress since came this week. Um, as of last Friday, we had collected $390,000 since they had spent on services since in fact February 21st. Which would, would it normally have been? We should normally collect about 340,000 every day. So in four weeks, we collected what we should collect every single calendar day, not the next day. Um, so it's very significant. It's a delayed impact to the financials. So we were still collecting on claims that were built out prior to the incident. Uh, this week, though, happy to report, actually today, we can confirm we are actually now getting some claims payments from electronic submissions um, since we moved to Trezetto. I think it was March 8th that we yep. started the transition to Trezetto. We're in the second group of hospitals to move to Trezetto. The first group was actually just, I think it was like two hospitals. Yeah, two that large. That's the new yep. And then they moved a group of 30 <laughs> hospitals, which one of them was us, the second group to Trezetto. And that it's not like an easy gear shift over. There's a whole lot of back end work mapping the payers uh, that goes on that we really didn't know about. Uh, we had a really fortunate timing. We had our prior revenue cycle director, Tara, take a IT job to primarily support revenue cycle from an IT standpoint. That happens in um, January. And then Lisa got as the new revenue cycle director. So they're both very experienced. And Tara's been 100% dedicated to the cyber incident since then. Uh, so we made a lot of good progress this week. It's like, I just want to thank Commissioner Ward who showed up with the revenue cycle and IT folks at Radio Hill this week to um, with a for a pizza party um, to thank them for doing things like getting paper bills out the door and resubmitting millions and millions of dollars of claims every day. So um, we reached out as the president of the, or chair of the finance committee meeting and, and Commissioner Ward attended. And I know the staff really, really appreciated that. Yeah, so as the start of the incident, Revenue Cycle, IT, and myself were meeting every morning to just update on the progress, what's going on, and forward, uh, started gathering information of all of our payers and what are submission methods that those payers will accept, and then could we meet those submission methods because the payers were saying we're not going to expend time with billing um, because we have all these other available methods to submit. It's not that easy though. Uh, so what we've been doing as of, I think it was February 27th, we started sending paper claims out. That's why I said the claims that we've been getting until today, we don't know if they're paying on the paper claims or if they're paying on the electronic submission tests. So when we send a claim out through Trezetto, they're they're green, they're in a not denied yet status until they're denied. So they're, we don't even know if they're accepted, they're just, we know which ones aren't denied. Uh, but we do have that confirmation today now they're paying. Yep. Uh, so a revenue cycle went, went back 30 years in history and started doing paper claims. Many of them have never done that type of work before. 
Um, and then the after they're uh, processed, we have to uh, put those remittance files to our patient accounts. So usually that's an electronic file back from the healthcare to KVH, and then we can electronically post those back to patient accounts. That also is broken at this. So even those claims that we got out before February 21st, insurance is processing those. We can't post them electronically back to patient accounts. So we have one individual that that's the only thing they're doing is keying in the remittances. She's totally staying up on it, but her, her keyboard is pad actually is worn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they are keeping up on it. So yeah. It's, and so major kudos to everybody. It doesn't cost to these clearinghouses. Are they all about the same as far as? So there, our cost is actually through it, Cerner contract. Yeah, embedded so, in the Cerner contract. Uh, it was like day three or day two that we notified our insurance of the breach. The, our liability insurance reached out. I had a call with their attorneys. Um, they asked for a contract. We don't have a contract because it's through Cerner. We probably don't have anything there to claim because of that. Except through perhaps, sir. Yeah. Yes. I just, because this is a public meeting and we're talking about breach, I just want to make it clear KVH was never breached. This was change was the one who was attacked, change was the one who, who was breached, and they disconnected from all of their customers. So rather than allow their customers, their clients to be breached, they left us hanging with no way to to process claims, which I think is probably the lesser of two evils. But I don't want anybody to think that PHI or systems at KBH were breached in this attack. That was not the case. And it was March 8th that the imaging became fully back online. Back on the so the impact there was our PAC system that's in the cloud for backup. We couldn't reach the archived images. Yeah, the, the change is so big, you know, that they uh, also provide radi radiology services. And so we have our PAC system on, we call it on-prem, on-premise, uh, but our archive. So any images that are older than six months, they go up to the cloud. Um, and at any time the physician needs to look at an old image, we can pull it back down. Um, he can pull it back down immediately. Um, but that was severed during this um, during this breach, and so it took till you know that time for us to restore that. Um, we had a workaround in place, and so I think very little patients uh, had to get rescheduled because in some instances, I think mammograms was one where they look at prior images, and so we wanted to make sure that we had a workaround or a system in place that. Um, we could do that and not have to reschedule uh, so many patients moving forward. So, but that's all been restored now. And the last piece is trying to get this uh, claims out the door. So the first piece of that was get the claims out the door. And now the second piece of that is trying to get all of the, we call it A35 or remits back and trying to get that squared up on the run cycle side. So we're moving over. I have to speak to their penetration in the market until November change was the EHR that we were using for home health and hospice. Uh, and in the packets too, I will ask for a resolution to later in the packet to bring forward a $2 million line of credit. And that was when we reached out to Casual Valley Bank right after the incident too to try to form a line of credit in case we need. Um, Mr. Anbun is cautioned. I do not anticipate that we will need to utilize that. I just, one thing I learned yesterday that I do want to share. And um, so our, our revenue cycle system is set up so that claims move through the system in buckets and the primary insurance will have paid and then things get moved to patient secondary or patient liability kind of buckets as it moves through the system. And they are worked by different people than revenue cycle. Um, because so much manual work, this 835, we've been circumventing that automatic kind of posting of things. Um, some of that automatic movement through the system from bucket to bucket is broken. So we're going to have to be very careful. And, and I don't know the status of the actual claims on February 21st, but that's another place. We need to make sure we know the status of every claim 
at that moment of cutoff, whether it was submitted, whether it's back. I think revenue cycle is going to need our support and understanding and more peace parties. <laughs> and while all this goes on, our daily work doesn't slow down. So, no. you know, as I think everybody's aware, we're getting beat up every day from Medicare Advantage and the denials, the appeals, and pushbacks. And then this work takes away from our fight back against those. So it does have significant other trickle effects. All right. Any questions for Jason and Jeff? Thanks for the update. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Scott, uh, HR and staff development. Yes. Hello. Um, Hi. We can I, I, yes. Hi. I don't have any additional information this month, but I'm happy to answer any questions. We've all had a chance to review the report. Is there any questions for Amanda? Thanks for such a uh, well-written report. Thank you. Uh, Ron Erlocker, expansion project update. Ron. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, our report's on page 28. And under project costs and schedule there, we will notice some significant changes there. Different things have been trending, so there was um, several things added to the schedule and those Days added to the schedules have equated to some costs. And um, so, yeah, we were um, trying to jump around and bring the project back on track as different things happen. So you kind of shift gears and go over here, go over here, and all these factors kind of come together and you finally get to a point where it's like, okay, <laughs> we're not going to be able to recover from this. So. That's kind of why there hasn't been changes in probably the last four reports. It's like we've been trying to bring it back in, but this is kind of where we settled in. Um, so on page 32 are just some of the major events that have contributed to that. And um, let's kind of briefly go over those. So in the winter, when they were pouring concrete, they had some steel connection issues that were going to be cast concrete. And there was questions on the methodology for that. And so there was a little bit of delay that they couldn't pour in the week that they planned on pouring. So it was pushed to the next week. They've got their answer. They got that corrected in the ground. But then the weather was cold and we couldn't get concrete. From it. The only concrete comes from the big down. And so, and it's really hard to pour in that really cold weather. So that pushed it out to the next week. And that's that's something that's in critical path. You, you just, it's kind of like a door to a store. You can't get your bananas and you can't get your, your soap because the door's closed. So um, that kind of helped things out. Um, There was some some added scope of we had some two areas of existing structure that didn't have fire spray on it. It was emitted when it was originally built. So we had to go back and correct that to bring that up to code. And so that took time, but it also prevented us from doing framing in those areas. So that was one of those things where we, we can jump over here, you know, and do this while that put that spray on. Once you put that spray on, it's about a week before that stuff sets up, soaking wet, non seeding And then the colder weather again, it doesn't dry all that fast. So that was a factor. Um, we added uh, some scope to the project. Um, so by the ED staff room, there's what used to be a doctor's lounge has been converted into more supply area for ED. If they needed that, so that was just added scope. Um, there was some discrepancies in the, the steel design for the penthouse, and um, so they had to stop erecting the penthouse until that RFI was answered, a solution submitted, and then the work done. 
again, in the interest of keeping the public record, the penthouse is where you store all your HVAC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't <laughs> So you guys have all, everybody on the board has had a chance to review these uh, explanations for the delays. Do you guys have any specific questions for Ron about any of these specific delays that are listed here? That you'd like Ron to explain? Yeah, I would just be curious, does anything that happens here have any shared financial responsibility with someone else? Or the construct? In other words, are, is, are we bearing the entire burden of all the costs of all of these? Kind of the, as far as the architects and the design team go, it's kind of industry standard. They get about a 10% error in emissions allowance. Once you get past that 10% standoff, we're still within that. Yeah. They're still under that. Yeah. I do track all that. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Ron about the specific? Uh, Explanations for the delay. So phase one is now scheduled for completion around June 12th. Correct. Right. Um, I, Ron and I talked about inviting the entire board for a walkthrough right before that closure, so towards the end of May, and then a sit down meeting with Ron and the architect to go through exactly what we're at with regard at the end of phase one with regard to the golden house. So yeah. you can ask some very in depth questions. Yeah, that'll be great. I think, uh, imagine all the board. Members are good with that. Oh, good. Uh, see if we have some pictures up there. Want to walk us through? Yeah. So that is the mechanical penthouse. <laughs> and yeah, up there. CT room, actually. We saw the CT outside today. The CT was delivered today. Yeah. The flooring's in there. The grids up and all the infrastructure. So they'll be installing that. Um, that's our RO pure water you know, treatment equipment for the CS. Sure, that just some pictures of the infrastructure by the ceiling. Everything's getting ready to get closed up. They've got grid back end materials management. So that's lights are going in and, and so they're kind of working their way around. And that's the uh, MRI copper box that shields that magnetic field and those are some of the devices that allow you to take infrastructure through that copper shield and that is inside the ct room picture is equipment and that is inside the mechanical penthouse there are pictures later That's some roof protection that they had up there. So I was talking about that fire spray and it's on the ceiling deck. And as you walk across the roof, it will flex some and you can have that stuff just fall off and it looks like a domino. So they tried to spread out the weight and we only lost a couple small areas and that. And that was also in the mechanical penthouse. All right. Good pictures. Let me see Any other questions for Ron? Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have the uh, 2023 compliance report out and then the compliance work plan for 2024. Cindy Kelly, so that Johns. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you. I just have a brief presentation for you. Uh, the 2023 work plan and the 2024 suggested work plan were included in the documents that were sent out on Monday. And the highlights for the past work plan in 2023 include what, um, our new document management software, Lucidoc. Um, with this software, we'll be better able to report compliance and timeliness for policies, procedures, contracts, and other documents. Uh, we went live with that software on March 19th, so I'm happy to have that. Uh, we did a lot of training in 2023. New employees, leaders, and providers received training at the time of their orientation. We used Biz Library to inform staff of compliance policies. We provide contact information and posters that are required posting in each department. 
We provide coaching to reporters of compliance issues. 100% of our staff assigned uh, completed the fraud, waste, and abuse policy training. We provided training to raise awareness of phishing, ransomware, and other examples of threats to our information systems. We provided role-specific privacy training to all staff. And we hosted an annual in-person meeting of the Washington Rural Health Collaborative Compliance Committee in October for the third consecutive year. Uh, in addition, we did a lot of compliance training with our staff during Compliance Week in 2023. Our Compliance Committee members reported monitoring and auditing activity regularly to the Compliance Committee. We monitor in several areas, including revenue cycle management audits, coding accuracy, 340B program, information security, quality initiatives, and regular sanction and vendor screening. Moving on to our work plan in 2024, the work plan for 2024 is pretty much the same as our past <laughs> year, but we did do a compliance effectiveness assessment and decided to add in-person compliance rounds to increase our presence in the organization, visual communications to increase communication between the compliance department and all employees, including the compliance bulletin board, an increase in communication to all volunteers via an update of policies to include volunteers where needed. That concludes my brief for you. Are there any questions? So pay special attention on pages 15 to 51 of the packet that we need to approve their work plan for 2020. Larry, you represent the board on compliance. Do you have any comments? Uh, so does, does anybody have any questions that uh, we could answer on these? And if you don't, I really want to move that we approve uh, this uh, because we need to have a motion and consequently all the, the board needs to approve this so that this will be the, the 2024 work plan. And since I uh, represent the, uh, the board on the compliance, uh, they've been doing a really good job in all the compliance that we're doing. And uh, Nasser, the pharmacy director, discusses the 340B compliance that we do all the time. And uh, since he's doing a good job with that compliance, uh, it raises a, a lot more buckaroos for us. Uh, so we, we get a little more extra money uh, through the 340B plan, which is really good. And one of the other things about that 340B plan, we also can uh, have uh, other pharmacies out in the community, community to do it. And Nasser talked about it in the compliance that Super One is also going to be associated with our 340B program. Uh, so that'll help us also increase uh, the extra money that we get out of the 340B pro program. So Nasser is uh, actually generating a lot of extra money. And so uh, it, does anybody have any questions about the work plan? Like, or can, yeah. I, can I move to, to vote on it now? No, I appreciate that, uh, Terry. So I'll take that to be a, a motion to approve. Are there any other questions, concerns, anything before we have a second? Uh, um, anything else? Okay, then do we have a second? I'll second. Second from Eric. Any further discussion? Questions? All those in favor of approving the 2024 compliance work plan, uh, please say aye. 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 Okay, that's your yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, you wonderful human being. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anything else, uh, Julie, before we move on? That's it. All right. Uh, on to operations, we start with our C and O, D D O. Good evening. My report is on page 53, and the only thing I would like to add, um, the very last bullet talks about our nursing assistant certification program. We have 11 applications already, and uh, we will be starting some interviews. We're going to start with a small cohort of five, and we're hoping for a start date uh, first week of May. So we'll start with five and hopefully build on that, and so very exciting. Um, and I also do want to um, call out and just thank the staff, as I know both Julie and Dr. Martin did in their reports um, regarding the care that was provided um, on March 15th down at our ER. It was not only our ER staff that, that really 
had a, a long day, but really the hospital across the board. So just thank you everybody for that support. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question. Yes. Can you tell me um, about the fourth trimester, the sessions with Bowie like, Sling? Yeah, so this is just one off the press. Um, I know I don't have all the details, but I do know um, that there is a, a worker there that will be working with the staff. Um, I know it's a very small group. I believe there is like an online sign up for it. And um, just to be able to provide some of that care that um, you know new moms might need after having a baby. I think mental health is is definitely an important topic across the for board. Sure. And you know, here's one other area that hopefully we can identify um, uh, women, families in need, and provide some services. Um, the the space that has been um, reserved. I'm imagining this spaces of time. Being reserved it's spaces of time, yes. Um, are those reserved so that how do I say this? So women might be closer to you. crisis or in immediate need can be seen sooner than maybe waiting months. I'm not sure maybe. how they're. I think it's just more of that maintenance. You know, okay. Obviously, we do have crisis services in our county. Um, you know, the nine eight eight number, our emergency department, our comprehensive health care. Um, so this is more definitely for a scheduled outpatient, uh, just to hopefully match up some people before they end up in crisis. Right. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. The nursing assistant program, that's uh, for internal and external outpatients? We have it open for internal and external. Um, I'm meeting with HR tomorrow and Amy Morse, who's our uh, program coordinator. Uh, they have been um, reviewing all the applications and you know trying to score them. Uh, so hopefully the the five that get chosen for this first cohort um, will be successful. And I think we'll probably learn a lot. Uh, and you know if people don't get in, we hope that they can reapply. Can I just take a minute to thank Amy? She's been here almost ninety days, days. <laughs> and came in and did this program up said get out of the way i got this and um she's just an absolute fire brand program the other thing i want to do is call out that uh, both Didi and, and Amanda specifically requested that these positions be paid positions so folks who rely on the income are so that they have temporary 90-day positions where they are paid as employees of the district so that people who rely on an income would not be excluded from getting this kind of opportunity. Great. They earn while awesome. they learn. Yeah. They're, they're basically getting paid to come to school because you know they really can't practice until they have that license. But between the classroom, um, the skills lab, and then your clinicals, uh, and then after that, hopefully they'll be able to transition into a, a regular FTE or the yeah, lab. Because we have lots For of sure. That's great. Yeah, I love these. Uh, Program these education or these training programs. So, any other questions for uh, Didi? I was just going to ask real quick on the Cody's portion of the report. He's got a bullet point uh, nearing full staffing, only two FTP positions currently open. And then the last bullet point is two providers are leaving. Is that the same position we're talking about? Or are these? No, they are not at the same position. So he's uh, talking about nursing, okay. but we do have, um, we did have two, uh, a physician and a nurse just retire. Okay. And their last day was last week and they were both long-term employees here. Um, so Does they've retired, uh, one being a, a provider and one a nurse. I don't remember what I read, how many years? So yeah. Susan, believe it or not, Susan Pinnock has been an ER nurse her whole career. And it's a total of 37 years, and she worked 27 here in our emergency department. Um, and then Dr. Frank Cruz, my memory serves right, he had been here for 17 years total through Team Health and Kennedy. Yeah. Sure. But yeah, we are, we've actually got some great ER staff. And if anything, I was talking with Cody today about having enough preceptors to precept all our new people. Um, so it's exciting. Any other questions for? Chief Thank you very much, Chief. Next up, we have uh, Rhonda Holden, our Chief Ancillary Officer. Rhonda. 
Hi, everyone. Um, my report is on page 56 and 57, and I don't have any other updates other than the CT was delivered today, so that was fun to watch across the parking lot. Um, otherwise, I'll just take any questions you may have. Any questions about uh, Lodge report? Just a comment of the, I love the escape room girls. I've been seeing stories about those on the news, and I think it's really neat to, you know, do something kind of a twist on it like that. Um, a little envious to not be able to participate in an escape room myself. So that's that's pretty neat. We'll invite you next time. Okay, deal. <laughs> Great. Go ahead, Chad. Um, just curious, now that the Beckman at least partially is installed, are we happy with it? Yeah, I think they are happy with it. Um, yeah. It is still, it's a learning curve and it's a lot of work. So, um, you know, there's been a few challenges here and there, um, but they're staying on top of it and and just getting any issues corrected uh, very quickly. So I think they're pretty happy. They'll be even happier when we get the full components in. Um, the the last part that will be coming coming in will be much easier for them. This uh, specimen handling portion. And that that's at the end of the year. We anticipate those being in and ready. Yeah, in the fall sometime. Katie is trying to escalate the arrival, but it is coming from Germany, so I'm not sure how successful we will be with that. I know it's through Baltimore. Yeah, tr translation, that is Julie is hounding Katie about getting those in, and so Katie's hounding the vendors. We just had a major bridge collapse. I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions for uh, Rhonda? I do. I with regard to the hospice referrals, I know that trying to extend people's time on hospice so they can take some advantage of that is been a goal for some time. Um, and we've discussed previously whether that's just um, getting information out to people and providing um, the right information about their opportunities. And um, I guess that's just kind of an ongoing target since it's um, new people to the same time, obviously. Um, is there any thought of, of what can be done to encourage people to take a greater advantage of hospice centers? Yeah, I, I hope that we can get to a point where we will be able to go out into the community and provide some more education um, about hospice and the benefits. It does seem like people, we have a lot of people that are very reluctant to go on service. Um, they're on home health um, and they are definitely declining, but they're just not ready to make that transition or they're still actively seeking some sort of a chemotherapy or radiation treatment and not ready to, to stop that as well. So that that's a hard one for sure. And I've always felt like we were way too high on that, but um, we just received some data this week um, where um, a five-day stay on hospice was at the 25th percentile in the United States. Um, and let's see, a two-day hospice stay was at the 10th percentile. So it's it's high everywhere. I don't think it's just us. And maybe some of it is, again, post-COVID people putting off treatment. This what are your thoughts? Sorry. Uh, uh, I don't know if Dr. Martin wanted to add to that. Looks like he had something to say there. Will you speak on this part too while you answer this? This 38% figure of seven days or less. It seemed, if I recall correctly, that's a smidge lower than we were before. Um, that's it. There's actually... Uh, that's on the quality dashboard as well. So you can see the trends, but so it is up. It's up from maybe a year ago when we, okay. One of the, one of the interesting things is that our hospice census is running just a little bit better than half of what it was pre pandemic, but the number of admissions we're doing is the same. It's it, the can change. In, that? So we're running just over half the census that we had pre pandemic but the number of admissions we do is essentially the same. So what the difference is that people aren't on as long. Yeah. But to Rhonda's point, that is a national trend. Um, and one of the things that uh, I hope for with uh, Dr. Stone's transition to medical director for community-based care services is that she'll be able to put some focused energy into getting the word out again. I did a lot of that pre-pandemic. And I'm looking at the quality dashboard, Eric, and it, it, it bounces around 38, 39. Like maybe 
it, it, there's this dilation of COVID time. So maybe yeah. it was like three years, four. It spikes at about 48 in the third quarter of 2022. It might be more than a year ago. Because, but I thought it was to the, like, I think that was right before COVID. Yeah. I, I feel like I remember that too. And it was like, yeah, we're making progress or getting, and then like, I think, I think it was like four years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and Rhonda, uh, just make sure you pass along to Kimmy how much we appreciate her efforts on those GE contracts and stuff. That's really okay. impressive. Yeah, she's done a great job. I'll pass that on. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions for Rhonda? Thanks a lot, Rhonda. Uh, Thank we you. do have a report on recall process policy from uh, Masher. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, so that's to present uh, the yes. recall policy. You can if you want to. So it's on pages 58, 59. Yeah. I'm not going to read every detail of the recall policy, but uh, the purpose to have the policy is to make sure that uh, there's no products, or in our case, in the pharmacy uh, medications, that uh, will jeopardize the safety of uh, the patients or the community in there. The definition is listed in there, but it's uh, in our policy, there's three types of recalls. Uh, class one recall, that is uh, a definition that the product will cause harm. So that's the, the most severe uh, recall type. Class two, that uh, is a, a may cause harm to the patient. And the class three recall, which is the most common, is this product uh, is not likely to cause harm. Um, so those... Um, those we can kind of take care of it in a, there's a time frame, right? It's not an immediate removal from our uh, uh, premises or uh, quarantine it. Uh, in our case, uh, we received the recall messages through various uh, channels. It could be from the manufacturer, it could be via fax, uh, it could be an uh, email. Um, sometimes you'll get all of them and the same product gets you know, half a dozen of different uh, types of recall information. And, uh, uh, you know, and it's, it's time consuming because we need to make sure that all lots and expiration dates of this of the product is uh, identified. Um, so in here, in the pharmacy, when we receive those messages, we look uh, to see, first of all, did we ever carry that product? For example, we know that we don't carry chemos. So as soon as we see chemos there, we didn't purchase any of those. Um, so those recalls, you know, we don't have to go through a whole list of all the lots and go to the shelf because we don't have it. But if it's something common, uh, you know, uh, uh, blood pressure medication, lisinopril, for example, you know, we haven't lisinopril for decades. So of course we have to, to go to the shelf and identify those lots and flip every tablet and to make sure that that's not a lot to the manufacturer type in there. Not only we do that, within the pharmacy, but we also have clinics that we might have sent. We have to identify if the product was uh, delivered to the clinic or delivered to a Pixis machines, right? Throughout the, our institution, including uh, Clialum now that has uh, Pixis machines there. So all those products has to be identified. So um, that's what we have the, pol uh, the policy. The policy actually is a request, is a whack. Every hospital has to have a uh, policy on what do we do how we quarantine it and how we respond. And uh, now we also have a tracking mechanism. So is if you're there, so if you go yeah, I didn't know. down to recalls, please. Sorry, you might have to like, <coughs> so I don't know why right the font is so small today. Right <laughs> so there's recall. So uh, we started doing this lately. So the last one says tracker. The last one right here. Yeah. So there. So we, oh. Oh, well, someone did it. Yeah, so we don't. But that's okay. We don't. Yeah, we don't. So this is uh, uh, what, what we have been doing. Is, yeah, thank you. So basically, that's what happened. So here's the last one that one of my pharmacy team members uh, placed in there. So this column in here says product use, a KVH, no, no, no. But we still had, we still went in because we purchased this product long time ago, but we don't use it anymore. So we still identified and kept uh, 
a log. So this tracker is not just pharmacy. So if you see at the end there, at the end there it says logged by, you can see the body, you know, for materials has been there. And uh, uh, Ron's team, Tara, uh, Tara's been there. So you can see the people uh, who's there. So this is for products and medications. Um, I think and Dave we, has the uh, sorry and um, central sterile too. Central sterile too. Address. So put the products in there. So like scopes that have recalls or something. Exactly. And uh, we are keeping within our policy, we're keeping those tracker for six years. So it after six years. And uh, uh, that is education that I um, I want to start to emphasize in where we're gonna. Do, uh, through this library, we're gonna uh, emphasize to the to the team members because the directors are not there every day. Also, Daniel's recalls it comes through via email or email. So we want to make sure that the staff is involved in those recalls and are waiting for us because if one of those days it might be a class one recall that we need to take action immediately. So we want to make sure that's uh, quarantine. So. Minimize the potential for harm in there. That's the presentation. If anybody has questions, uh, I have a little bit to talk about because uh, I'm the one that invited him to come to this meeting. Uh, I uh, was able to do a gimba on the safety committee, and I uh, I really think that some of the other commissioners might want to do a gimba on the safety committee because it was really interesting to listen about all the safety going on in the hospital here uh, and that safety committee meeting is all a zoom meeting it's around eight o'clock in the morning and they do it once a month so I, I think it'd be really good and the other thing is interesting last year uh, there was 65 drugs or iv solutions that were recalled and uh, nasser did a really good job that we only had 54 of those in our facility and they were a hundred percent taken care of within 24 hours. So that way there wasn't any damage with it. And then there was also 23 devices or equipment also recalled uh, last year. And those 23 devices recall were also taken care of uh, within 24 hours. So consequently, uh, that was really interesting uh, in, in the safety committee. And then, uh, the director of materials management is responsible for communication of the recall notice is checking files to determine that the products KVH has purchased uh, for uh, monitoring the follow up of the products to make sure they're, they're all gone. Uh, so that's uh, another interesting thing. And then Mandy also uh, does a report in the safety committee. It's according. actually Holly Carrazzo, our risk manager. She works with all of the Team, yeah. the recalls team on, um, they all work together. So I, I just thought it was really, uh, inter, uh, that was something really that we should discuss here just for a short time on how wonderful uh, the safety committee can uh, uh, talk about things that we're doing and that we're doing a very safety. So uh, I don't have any other really comments here, but I, I do think that it would be really nice if you uh, did uh, invite one of the other commissioners to be a gimba on the safety committee so they could at least listen to it. And uh, they would also understand how great the safety is in our hospital here. And thank you for your report, uh, Nasser, because I thought it was really good to understand uh, all the safety and recalls that we have to take care of because so many drug companies uh, damage their medications, even though they ship them out. And then we have to make sure that uh, they're not accidentally used. Uh, and so consequently, uh, we are very, very safe. Well, they, I mean, yeah, we appreciate the, the presentation. I know Nestor's always been very open. If any of us wanted to take a, a Gemba, you know, I'm sure uh, he'd be happy to show it. Yeah. So if you're, you are interested in doing something like that, uh, please just reach out uh, to Manny and maybe can, can sort of arrange it to are there any questions for Nasser about uh, about this presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Good job. All right. Uh, next up, we have Stacey Alea, Chief of Clinic Operations. Stacey. My report is on here.
pages 60 and 61. I've got nothing to add, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions about the report or the dashboard? I just heard a couple of uh, anecdotes, stories from the clinics in the last couple of days, and um, I want to thank Stacy and some just really um, hands-on dogged work that she's doing around the phones, but also around things like no-shows. And she told me the other day up in family medicine, Ellensburg, the no-show rate is down, and it's down because they're making phone calls and they're trying to get people in. But if they have a no-show in family medicine, Ellensburg, Somebody will run downstairs and see if someone's waiting in rapid access to see if they can pull them to fill that spot. So just a lot of really active staff just chipping away at those data points of customer service that we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah thanks for all that uh, really sort of detail about the crowd. Appreciate it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Stacy, the uh, the new patients by clinic, the blue bars, is that just the current month? That yes, that is just the current month. Okay. So about the 1,200 patients, that's the distribution you see for that month. Thank you. Other questions about the report or the dashboard? Thank, thank you very much, Stacey. If there's nothing else from operations, and we'll move on to the medical staff. We'll start with our chief of staff, uh, Dr. Hoppe. Uh, yes, yeah, so the MEC... Uh, met this month and uh, we reviewed, I think, nine credentialing files for, for initial appointments and five for reappointments. Um, and you have a list there, happy to add, answer any questions. And also we have two different uh, documents for the board to review, the privileges for internal medicine and hospital medicine. We did uh, commend those privileges based on the MEC recommendations as well as Dr. Holmes recommendations. And I'm happy to answer any questions regarding these documents. And they've tracked the changes on those, so hopefully you can help. See that. Let's start with the uh, <clears throat> the recommendations for appointment and reappointment. Uh, I think you've all had a chance to review these online. So, um, move to approve. Okay, you know, a, motion, a motion to approve from John, second from Terry. Are there any questions, any discussion about this? Uh, this list. Hearing none, then um, all those in favor of approving the MEC's recommendations for appointment and reappointments, uh, please say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Then we move on to the, uh, the delineation of privileges for internal medicine and hospital medicine. Uh, yeah, they talked about this in the MEC. Uh, Julie, do you have any concerns or anything about these? Um, no, I. I... Circled back to Dr. Thomas and, and didn't have a chance to talk to Dr. Hoppe. Um, they are um, eliminating some of the procedures that are done there, but there is a mechanism if somebody does want to perform those procedures for them to come back and ask for special privilege. Or a color part. Yep. So you get you get picked. Okay. Anything you want to add about either one of these? All right. Thank you, Doctor. Are there any questions about? Uh, Let's start with the uh, internal medicine delineation of privileges. Any questions about that before I uh, we entertain a motion? So I have a motion to approve the uh, internal medicine delineation of privileges. Welcome. Okay, we have I'll a second. motion from Bob, uh, second from Erica. Uh, if there's no further, no further questions or discussion, all those in favor of approving the internal medicine delineation of privileges, please say aye. 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 Then we'll move on to the uh, hospital medicine donation privileges. Same deal here. Any questions uh, about this one? All right. Hearing none, uh, do I have a motion to approve this? I move to approve it. Motion from Terry. Second, second. Second from John. There are no further questions or discussion. All those in favor of approving the hospital medicine donation privileges, please say aye. 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 Yes, yes. Thank you. Anything else, Dr. Hunter? Uh, no, we're working on uh, the MD stat um, software just to let you know I'm making great progress and stay tuned. We're hoping to run a test case through the software uh, next month, testing that. And so it's coming along very nicely. Well, it's going to allow us to um, track our OPPE, so to follow physicians as well. So Excellent. stay tuned. Oh, yeah. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. We will transition now from our chief of staff to our chief medical officer. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, Dr. Martin, go ahead, Dr. Martin. Uh, my report is on page 68 and 69. Uh, the two things that I would call out are both under CMO activities. First was our provider appreciation dinner, and I want to thank Matt and Terry for attending that last night. Uh, and the second is the final bullet um, to Didi's earlier point. Um, every once in a while, uh, those of us who don't live in the emergency department get an opportunity to see the work that goes on there every day. And for us, it's amazing. For them, it's another day at the office. Are there any uh, questions, discussion about? Uh... Go ahead. Um, providers in progress, third one down. Um, you just didn't indicate, is it a, a doctor or an APC? What, uh, that's an APC. That's an APC. Okay. Thank you. And, I, um, the other, uh, behind the scenes change is that the orthopedics APC that's referenced here, um, there is one in process. It's just not the same one. Same count, different yep. person. Uh, you had an applicant who, uh, whose uh, clinical references were in response, so we had to withdraw the off offer, but then we had a, another letter of intent signed this morning. Good. The, the provider appreciation that we had uh, was really wonderful, uh, and I really appreciate Julie. Uh, she did some dis big, good discussion. Uh, at that meeting, and so did Dr. Martin. And so it was really interesting to see all the providers that were there and the, to celebrate their uh, uh, and appreciate them being there. And there was some historical ones that have been a, a provider here for a long time in Kittitas Valley uh, doing a lot of life saving. So that was a really wonderful appreciation. Yeah, it's nice that we can uh, celebrate the accomplishments of our local providers here. And Michelle Wardle's team just did an absolutely amazing, amazing job. And I understood they stayed well into the night playing Boggle or what? Yeah, so they <laughs> stuck around with Dr. What were they playing? I had to beat Dr. Thomas at a game of Jenga. Uh, <laughs> and then we have a couple of doctors here that I definitely appreciate. Yeah. Yay. Um, yeah. Uh, anything else for Dr. Mark? Excellent, Dr. Martin. Okay. Move on to uh, finance with our CFO, Jason Adler. Jason. Thank you. My report, page 70. Um, still reporting an operating loss, but happy to report it is less of a loss than the last five months. So $215,000 operating loss, $185,000 net loss. Some good contributions to this are we have slightly contracted a little bit in total operations. If you look at January, February, um, total charges are coming in a little bit less than January, February of last year, total charges um, mixed with inflation and then the recruitment retention um, with the, the local tenants. But we're seeing that coming down and we're also seeing agency labor coming down in the nursing like DD was talking about. Uh, the OR staff, nurses, the ER staff, nursing, we've had some really good recruiting successes and some really good nurses coming on. So um, <clears throat> most significant impact obviously has been just cash flow. So the cyber attack incident, um, that's driving AR days to go up really quickly. Um, so that went up from, I think it was 74 days last month to 80.6 AR days this month. I'll anticipate that to go up significantly again in March, but then given how this week is going, April, I will expect that to taper off and then start coming down. Um, days cash on hand decreased to 168.8 days, so that is planned to decrease due to the project spending, so we had planned on spending $30 million of our capital on that, and then this month, though, it has Went down a little quicker because of the cyber attack. Uh, and if you look on the income statement there, the stats we have, I guess on the stats there, the clinic visits were below budget 
3% and below year to date by 7%. However, that is a much better number than we've had the last five months. So um, that also contributes to having a little bit less of a loss this month. Um, on the income statement there, that one to note on the temporary labor. So last year, year to date, January, February 2023 had $940,000 in expense. This year we're coming in at 560,000. So year over year since 2020, we've been coming down on that agency labor number. And that's a big thanks to our recruiters and all our directors for working at open positions. Any questions on finance? Questions? Okay. And we have been a response to the Cyber attack. I did reach out to Cadbury Valley Bank for a line of credit. Um, they had tentatively approved us for a two million dollar line of credit. We need a board resolution to for us to be able to sign and approve that line of credit to move any further. Uh, again, it's just been an abundance of caution. I really do not anticipate the need for this line of credit, but it. There's no downside to having this. It does not go on for our balance sheet unless we use it. Um, there's no fees unless we use it. If we do use it, it's just a uh, prime interest rate. And so everybody has a copy of this in front of them here. Uh, they could see. And then at some point, if we didn't need it, we would move to hold off. It's a one year, it'll auto So it's fired one year. Yep. yep. And as that leads up to one year, we can renew it and keep that open, but it'd be something every year that we would need to, to do. So we did late. this in 2020, sorry, for when COVID started and that was a 5 million line. So this is a, a, a very similar setup. And, and just out of curiosity, the two versus the five, is that our choice or the bank's choice or a mix of both? The bank. It's been very conservative. Yep. So it's a very unusual ask of them. It's an unusual uh, service that they offer. They don't do much healthcare lending on a line of credit type work. They are familiar with uh, hospital AR or tying it to an asset. So that's where they were. They just came in at the two million. Just operations. So yes. Yeah. The COVID one, they were comfortable with larger because of all the CARES Act. They have the safety security that they have to so it's uh, resolution number 24-02, resolution of the commission of public hospital district number one, uh, authorizing Julie and or Jason uh, to enter a rolling line of credit with Cashmere Valley Bank in the amount of $2 million. Do so you guys each have a copy of this? Are there any further questions or discussion? And uh, is there a motion to approve this resolution? I'll move to approve this resolution. Moved by Erica, second, second by Bob. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of resolution number 24 02, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, then we have a couple of ex capital expenditure requests. Just to remind the board uh, that last one for the Radio Hill parking expansion, we've moved that into executive session. We're going to discuss it there before making any sort of moves on that. Uh, but we do have two others, uh, Jason. Uh, you want to talk about the uh, one that starts on page 83, the therapy services? Yep. So, the first one to talk about is the Cleon therapy services. And this is to do tenant improvements to 506 Power Street. It is a property and building that Hospital District 2 purchased late 2023. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old church. So, the ground floor is totally open, except for one little corner where it's a carve out for a Male and female restrooms. Um, this project will get that that location to ADA accessibility to where we can shift our physical therapist from, from the family and Cleon clinic into this building, which the real opportunity we're trying to get in here is to free up the space in the primary care clinic and be able to expand the services in there while being able to expand therapy services at the same time. Uh, You'll notice from Dr. Martin's uh, report that we have Dr. Ashley Folker starting in August of this year. So he'll be there and building a team around. It would be prudent to have that 
space available when he arrives. Yeah, and we will, we're continuing to still recruit for an additional provider up there as well. So this will make it to where they can um, accommodate two additional providers from her. Really a wonderfully blank canvas to work with. It is, we, we did luck out in that. There's no walls to demo. The ceiling is actually so high that they're just gonna add a drop ceiling in below it. Um, so the, the design, how it is laid out does make the construction easier to remodel refresh. And just for the uh, other commissioners to hear, this is an actual bid. This is not an estimate that we're gonna go out to bid. This is a bid we have to yeah, correct. And it's under the small books project. Yeah, it's under the small books project. Anything else? Uh... John or Bob from the Finance Committee about this that uh, we should know before we entertain a motion. Can I just talk about the mechanics of this? So, yeah. Hospital District 2's board has um, moved to that Hospital District 1 has the authority to work directly with the KDH Foundation for the $200,000 reimbursement that was part of the purchase agreement for the church. So, $1.2 million is paid by Hospital District 2. The uh, sellers uh, awarded back to the foundation $200,000 fees for this project. So, um, and then we notified on Monday night the foundation that we would be in need of this money. So, this is a three board sort of dominoes that we're looking at here, and they are agreeable to that. So, Hospital District One will contract directly for these tenant improvements and then go directly to the foundation with the $200,000 reimbursement. Um, and I would just add that uh, the, the only little negative point is that we have a two-year temporary occupancy permit. It's my, my understanding that we'll essentially be in continuous talks with them to look to expect, you know, extend that until we have a, a long-term resolution just so that uh, we're not investing something we get kicked out of in two years. So uh, after that discussion, I uh, support moving forward uh, based on everything we talked about in the finance committee. That, uh, that's a motion, motion if you want it to be. All right. So John makes a motion. And the, the, what's who'd like to make a second? I'll second. Second from Erica. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the capital expenditure request for Clay Allen's therapy service building renovation, please say aye. 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 Next up, then we have the uh, another capital expenditure request. Yeah. This one for the general surgery renovations. Yeah. So this one is. A little more complex, a lot larger project, and it pulls together really two projects the general surgery clinic that's in the Mediplex, and then right next door to that, the KBH orthopedics, the uh, old KBH orthopedics practice, and the old KBH pediatrics practice um, into one, one larger project. So it's really two phases. The first phase of this is general surgery. There is a significant amount of work in general surgery that needs to be done for. It's um, end of life end of life HVAC supplies or mechanical equipment, um, and then the other piece of that in general surgery is this project will bring the clinic up to provider based specifications. So when we did a sort of a facelift of that clinic about two years ago, we didn't we didn't really move walls around, change uh, exam room sizes, and this project does that. It creates the each of the exam rooms should be to provider-based spec, which, which is to match hospital-based or hospital-based construction. Uh, that project will also change from currently they have five exam rooms, so it'll increase it to seven exam rooms, and it'll be a more modern way of practicing for the providers that are there. We also, since the time that general surgery moved in there, we added vascular to that clinic. So they're very tight in their current layout of how they are. Um, do you want to add anything on general surgery? No, you covered it, except to say that tight is a gentle understatement. Yeah. Well, can I just point out the orthopedic clinic there next door to general surgery is vacant right now. So the plan vacates general surgery entirely over to orthopedic surgery, which makes that remodel a lot more convenient for the staff and for the patients. So, that's the reason that this project is staged. Am I right thinking that uh, because of uh, our issues with cash flow right now, you could push us off a little bit? 
wouldn't have to do it like anyway. Yeah, so we, I do not think that we have to take this project right away. It could be stalled, but it could be done in a couple ways. So we could move it forward at a slow pace. This request is to take it to a bid, mm -hmm. so a public bid. So that, that will take probably a three month span before we get bids back. And then that bid would come back before the board for acceptance. And three months would be if we were going at a fast pace to get that done. Right. Um, the orthopedics, so general surgery, they're currently practicing as they are. They are tight on space. Orthopedics, they did shift over to the Medical Arts Center Clinic. Uh, and they are doing well right now, but they do have cheaper values, as Dr. Martin noted. We have one more coming in and we have short time to sign a lot as well. So that that practice at the Mac will be very tight as well. So because this is taking it to bed, it's at least a three month lag for any ethics. We're also concerned about with the current expansion project going on, but it's my view to parking. Parking's already very, very tight. And frankly, we're intrigued by what, uh, it, since Walker is already here and staged, what that might mean to a bit if Walker determines that they want to bid on this project. There's some push to delay it, but also some push to move it up to see if we can get some truly competitive bids. So Bob or John, anything to add from the finance committee? I would add that, uh, like we hit on a moment ago, the positive is for this next phase, we've already spent the money for the design. So we're not incurring any significant expenses to go out for bid. But like was commented with the cash flow concerns, this lag at least gives us a chance, hopefully, for the change healthcare situation to resolve itself, get the normal cash flow going. Just see it as an institution if we continue to stabilize and move back towards uh, not having negative uh, numbers each month. So it's it's a it's a bit of a balance, but I think if we don't rush it, but we put it out there, we've got an, an inherent delay in that. But if we do get a solid bid, we're excited about. We're not wasting another year as we try to get people out of the Mac where they should be, and then that frees up space in the Mac used for other things um, that might be more appropriate for that. So very long winded way of saying that, uh, you know, we should go slow in, in some regards, but it's probably best to move forward and at least go out for this in the near future so that we've got another decision to make in the summer once we get those bids and we've learned more about where we stand at that point. Is this a smart thing to move forward with? Do we have solutions for parking? Things like that. Another nice thing about this project is almost all the work is in inside the building. So we're, we're not putting up with seasonality or pouring concrete and weather locations that could theoretically be started. And we, we'd also talked about maybe this would be one where we would incur debt and, you know, amortize it over yeah. 20 years or whatever. So some different things. Yeah. So we think about once we get closer and we'd have to sign something pretty soon that we can backdate. Is that correct? I'd bring it to the next board meeting. Yeah. Okay. So that we, again, just keeping our options open. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or discussion before we entertain a motion? All right. Do we have a motion to approve the uh, capital expenditure request for orthopedic general surgery renovations? Are you going to move? Because I'm going to second you. All right. I'll, I'll move. <laughs> All right. John makes a motion. Second from Erica. There you go. Any, uh, with no, any, if there are no further discussion, no further question, please say aye. 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 Approve it. Thank you. Anything, and as I mentioned earlier, the parking expansion radio with Hill, we're going to talk about that in executive session um, as because uh, it's covered by property real estate, and uh, we won't make any. We won't make any votes or any decisions in executive session as per usual. So. Um, anything else? Oh, no, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have the community relations report with Michelle World. Michelle. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to echo Julie's thanks to my team. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to join last night, but they did an amazing job, and it sounds like it was a great event. So I just wanted to thank them on that. And then the only other thing I wanted to add to my report is I promised you some diamond award winners for the month of March. 
And we got those winners today and we'll be putting it out in this week's huddle. For ENT and allergy, it was Aaron Olander. Aaron is a ARMP over in the clinic. Um, Kimmy Greenwood was selected for imaging. Kimmy is the director of imaging. Katie Bellotti, uh, the director of laboratory was selected in that area. And Jeannie Jennings is, uh, what's her title, Rhonda? Do you remember? Uh, is a, in cardiopulmonary. She's been with us for years. I don't know if it's actually patient access that she does. Stacy, do you? I think she's PSR. She's a lead PSR. PSR. Okay. There you go. Um, so those were this month's award winners. They will be notified tomorrow and they'll get a great little package on that. Be featured in our huddle and online. And in April, we will be featuring FME, materials management, and case management for social services. Other than that, I will take any questions that you have. Any questions from the show? Thanks again for all your work on the provider appreciation. Any questions? My team did that, and I will pass that along. Yeah, I uh, I thank the ones who were there, and uh, they uh, they do a lot of work. So, yeah, a lot of good work. Yeah, it was wonderful. Other uh, questions, comments from Michelle? All right, thank you, Michelle. All right, so look, um, we're going to do something a little different tonight. Uh, we have, I realize that all of you have, a lot of you in this room started really early and it's late for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a five-minute break before we get to sort of board-specific stuff 